Welcome to Experiments in Leadership. I am Sonu Bhaseen. Before I introduce my guest today, I do want to ask you all to subscribe to my channel. It has some really great conversations with really cool people and it is free to you. So go for it. My guest today is Rajiv Inamdar. He has built his career across many multinational companies in the areas of marketing and market research. Uh, for one, he has also worked with two of the large and well-known search firms. After retiring from the formal workplace, Rajiv has been an advisor and an independent director on boards of companies. He's also written a book titled Adventures of an Itinerant Executive. He's also the president of his Residence Welfare Association. Looks like he keeps himself very busy. And therefore, I am so happy that he found time to be here today. Thank you, Rajiv. And welcome to Experiments in Leadership. Um, getting straight into the conversation. You know, did your varied work experience across the world truly prepare you to be the president of your RWA? And has this been the easiest or the toughest of all your responsibilities? Uh, yeah, I, I have to. Firstly, let me thank you, Sonu, for inviting me onto your show. Uh, it's an Welcome. honor to be associated with uh, all the luminaries whom you've interviewed in the past. Uh, so, yeah, coming back to your question, uh, the most difficult job I have ever done yeah. is to be president of my RW. <laughs> kind of assumed it and that's why I asked this very leading question. So yes, tell me more was, why. You know, I described this job like the job of a general manager of a five-star hotel uh -huh. where every guest of the hotel is an owner of the hotel. <laughs> Can you imagine how difficult that general manager's job is? Yeah, yeah. Right? So uh, yes, I I have to say that forty years of the of corporate life had, I think, helped me to prepare for this one. Yeah. Um, it teaches you leadership of people. It teaches you humility. Mm. It teaches you what really being a servant leader is all about. Mm. Right? Because you mm. when you when you say something, half mm. the RWA doesn't agree with you. Mm. You have to cater to needs and whims and fancies of lots of different clients and customers of yours. Right, right. And you have to be very democratic. You cannot be autocratic. Hmm. You have to genuinely have a desire to serve the community. Otherwise, nothing gets done for your right. condominium. Right. So, yes, uh, it, is, it is a very challenging job. And uh, by the way, I... Did it for two years. I recently stepped off that. Uh, okay. So you had the choice. No, but you know, the way that you're describing it, and I guess all of us have our own different RWAs, and we know what happens in there. Now, you know, putting it together with leadership, uh, how do you, you know, what aspects of leadership are important? Uh, what did you discover uh, that you had to do differently as a president of the RWA, very different from you know what you would have done as a corporate leader. So just just, just you know how how does it how does it work? Because uh, being president of a company and being president of RWA, how how are the two same and how are the two different? Well, you know, they're same in the sense that you have responsibility for the entire organization, so-called. You have staff who you have to manage yeah. and motivate. Uh, and you have to have certain targets and goals which you have to meet, whether it's in terms of saving cost or improving infrastructure or improving the performance of you know various people who work for you, et cetera. So in those ways, it's very similar to leading any kind of organization. Yeah, yeah. The difference, however, is that if you're a, in a corporate setting, if you're a leader, pretty much what you say ultimately goes, right? You, right. you lay down uh, the law in a, way, in a way, Yeah. and people are more or less obliged to follow you, even if they don't agree with you. Right, right. So you can get things done in a somewhat more efficient manner than would happen in a RWA type of setting. Hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. I right. took on a project, which was, I think, very challenging. But the condominium I happen to live in is 25 years old. And hmm. uh, some of the infrastructure starts giving way. So what I discovered is that the pipes in the condominium, hmm. water and sewage, all hmm. have to be replaced because they were in danger of almost imminent collapse in many, many of the buildings. Hmm. Now, when you replace all the water and sewage pipes, it's a very invasive procedure because you have to enter every apartment. Hmm. You have to disconnect their water connections. You have hmm. to reinstall, you know, very complex uh, yeah. layout of pipes. Yeah. And you have to get the cooperation of every single resident who has to allow your team to go in and work in those conditions and shut off your water supply or you know your toilets are not working yeah. for a few days etc now trying to get cooperation from many house owners hmm. who, are, who are not convinced that the hmm. project needs to be done at all hmm. <laughs> okay so many of them said but my apartment is okay. There's no problem. Nothing is leaking. Mm. So why should I pay for this project? You have to charge also, mm. right? Not, mm. not cheap to get these things done. So you have to create a fund and you have to charge people. So they said, we won't pay because we don't agree that this is required. So how do you then, you know, ensure that everybody falls in line and does something which is actually an absolute necessity for the survival of the condominium? Because if pipes start breaking down, you're not going to have water no. supply. Yeah. Not no, everybody is if coming. I, if, I, if I interrupt you here abruptly, uh, like any RWA member would, uh, you know, what you're talking is uh, actually concerns a very important part of leadership, which is influencing others. Yes. So with, in a corporate, like you said, if you are the president, your word is the law and people jolly well listen to you. Otherwise, you know, there, there are consequences. But we've all been taught and, you know, everybody says that leadership is all about getting buy-in from people and, you know, uh, influencing them. Uh, given your RWA experience, did you actually use a lot of that influence, building con consensus and, you know, influencing people to change their thought during your corporate uh, uh, life? So, uh, well, one attempted to do this. I mean, uh, you know, even in corporate life, you do have to use your influencing powers uh, quite often for people to understand what your thinking is. And yeah, one. it's just that ultimately what you say goes, but it's not that you should not try to hmm. use, uh, you know, powers of persuasion to get hmm. your thinking. Done. Very similar to that is the situation in this RWA. The only difference is that uh, people don't have to listen to you, even though you may attempt to persuade them. Hmm. So yes, one did attempt a lot of things. Hmm. Hmm. Detailed presentations, hmm. appointed consultants who had credibility to explain to people what the technical issues were, hmm. Hmm. used a lot of email communication, explaining in great detail what the issues mm. are, why it's being done, what, is the, what mm. are the imperatives. Mm. Uh, and uh, all of that uh, certainly was attempted and uh, it worked in most cases. Mm. There are always the few diehards who will not agree to what. Yeah, who will not. Which happens in an organization, a corporate setting as well. Yeah, right? yeah, it does. You know, today we are all very politically correct and we talk about, uh, you know, being nice to people. But right. I guess the era that you and I grew up in, like we are like ancient compared to some of the new ones today, uh, life was uh, a little different and maybe a little easier. So uh, what is your view as a leader? And, you know, we can be politically incorrect if we want to. Uh, not having to pay any consequences, you know, does it affect the working of an organization? Uh, in the sense that if people know that they have nothing to lose, are they still going to work 
in an aligned manner uh, towards the uh, organization? So, uh, I don't think... Is that, is, sorry, sorry, let me just make it simpler. Is the fear of punishment an important tool that a leader has in his or her quiver? Absolutely it is. I mean, uh, see, at the end of the day, you, as a corporate leader, now I'm talking about corporate leaders. Corporate leaders, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to set targets and goals for your organization if you want right. that organization to succeed. Right. And there have to be rewards associated with meeting those targets and goals. And there has to be some, I wouldn't call it punishment, but it, there has to be some disincentive hmm. for people not attempting to align with you and meet your goals. Right. Now, during my corporate career, I learned a very interesting technique. Hmm. Uh, HR HR tool, if you like, hmm. align the organization around your thinking and your goals. Hmm. This is called the line of sight principle. Okay. So what you do is you have your board or your you know bosses in the parent company or whatever. They have certain targets for you as the CEO, right? You you are given a revenue target, profit target delinquency target, whatever it is. And usually these are fairly numerical targets. What you do as to ensure that everybody is aligned around you is that you translate those targets into goals and numbers for everybody in the organization below you. So in other words, your first line of reportees yeah. will inherit some of those targets. They, you know, maybe not all of them, but they will inherit some of the ones which they are responsible for uh, catering to or uh, achieving. Yeah. Similarly, they will pass down to their next line some of those targets and goals. All of these are number driven, right? Mm -hmm. So every single individual in the organization inherits a goal or a number or a target which his CEO is actually striving for. Right. Now, let us say, take a simple or simple example. Customer satisfaction. Hmm. Right? Let's say you're in a service organization like a bank or a research firm or whatever, and you have clients. And typically, good companies do customer satisfaction surveys, which give you a score out of 5 or 10, saying, this is my average customer satisfaction score. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, that number should, should be owned by everybody in the organization, whether he's in the back office trying to help customers indirectly yeah. or in the front office dealing with customers directly. Hmm. Hmm. If they all share the same number, yeah. which is my number, the number I have to achieve. Aggregates up, yeah. Aggregates up, right? So everybody then is working towards a certain goal and hmm. they all know how it's going to be measured. Hmm. And they know that if we exceed that goal, we will get a bonus. Hmm. If we don't meet that goal, we will get a very low increment or maybe... Hmm. 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 So that sort of clarifies everybody's thinking. Hmm. That, okay, these are the five, ten things I have to achieve this year hmm. because the CEO has to achieve it. Hmm. 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 So the job of a CEO becomes much easier when he is trying to achieve something, right? Because everybody is yeah. aligned around his thinking. Yeah. They, it's very explicit. It's all number driven. Mm. And I think it's a very positive force in the organization. It is. It is. And you did say that, you know, people know that if they have, uh, if they achieve their targets, achieve their numbers, there's going to be a bonus financial incentive and there's a financial disincentive. Yeah. Now, uh, Money is important, but money is not the main reason. I think it's not the top. It's one of the top five. Sure. So what other uh, tools, implements does a leader have to ensure that the people uh, uh, follow the, you know, the 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 organization's uh, objectives? So if not money, what else works for uh, people? So 
what are some of the stuff that leaders can use? Because, you know, there's a lot of uh, mid-management and junior senior management people who watch the podcast. And when they're, when they're talking about uh, their teams, I mean, the first thing is, of course, financial incentives. But a lot of them also say that, you know, there are people for whom, you know, money is not the main motivator. Sure. So, so what I did you well, discover? I think motivation differs depending upon your uh, stage in life and your age in an organization. Okay. Uh, so when you're young, right? Yeah. Uh, I find that up to a certain point, hmm. money is very important. Right, mm. because you started working, you maybe have just got married. Right. You have you have expenses. Your income is not typically very high. Mm. So money is a great motivator, and a lot of people change jobs for small amounts of additional. Income. Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, once you have crossed a certain threshold in terms of living standards and money, mm. money becomes less important. And mm. it is to learning and growing professionally. Mm. Mm. It's, it's a little, it's a little counterintuitive. One mm. should expect that happens at the first stage. But what I find is, you hire somebody fresh out of college or business school or whatever, mm. very keen to attain a certain salary level. Right. Hang the learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and also someone, because all fresh MBAs believe that they know it all. So also, they're saying, Humko aur kya learn karna hai. I also, think by the time they spend 5-10 years, they realize that they have a lot to learn. Absolutely. Hmm. And then the focus shifts on, I need to grow professionally. I need to uh, take on, do some courses. I need to expand my knowledge base. I need to explore different parts of the organization, hmm. etc. So there the motivator can be, you know, Things like that. Give them mm. opportunities to change functions. Mm. Give them opportunities to attend some training programs. Mm. Give them exposure to various kinds of knowledge bases. Right. And expand their uh, horizons, basically. Mm. 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 And then again, you know, you kind of shift back into the money earning mode. Mm. Money becomes a motivator again because now I have some serious responsibilities and costs. Hmm. Right. Buy my house. I need to send my daughter to college in the US. Right. You know, and then so at a certain stage in life, again, you know, it becomes important. Promotions and the financial rewards associated with that do become important. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then again. Further down the line, once you hit your maybe your mid forties or your mm. early 40s, mm. money ceases to continue to be that important a motivator because you have enough now, mm. and now you are thinking differently. How do I give back to society? How do I educate people? How do I, you know, grow my own team and mm. cater to their needs? How do I become a servant leader? A lot of people are thinking. And motivation starts changes. I think. In no, I think that's that. I think what you you've just described the life cycle of an of a of a of a leader. Now, um, and therefore, I think you, uh, you as a leader need to actually be aware of the life stage of your team members, and Absolutely. therefore, one model may not fit all. And Absolutely. since you're also on a lot of boards. Uh, I guess the 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 board also has to be aware of how to motivate the MD CEO and the other KMPs uh, or the CXOs because from what I understand, money may not work uh, always. So boards also have to think of what is the other uh, stuff that they can use to motivate uh, the MD CEO to continue to do well. Uh, what, what part does recognition play, internal and external, in this? I think it plays an extremely important role, and uh, we and in my my career uh, in some companies we have used reward and recognition programs quite effectively. Mm. Uh, mm. So I'll give you an example. It's a 
it's a very simple little thing, right? So let's say you have the junior people who are constantly working on some projects where they have clients and they have to su support those clients and, hmm. Hmm. and uh, help their clients to succeed, right? Right. Now, we introduced a very simple little thing. These are for youngsters who are yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. in their 20s and 30s hmm. uh, called the smiley. So smiley. What Hmm. Sort of smiley, right? So what happens is, let's say a, a researcher sends a, a good report to his client and the client sends him a two-line email saying, fantastic report, extremely well done, hmm. happy with the work. Hmm. This earns your researcher a smile. So his boss will see that email, his direct boss, and forward it to the HR team saying, recommend the smile. Smiley. Hmm. smiley is worth maybe a thousand rupees. Ah, okay. Hmm. Now, if he gets five smileys, hmm. then he goes and picks up his cash from the HR department. Oh, wow. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, now, so, so what this does is it motivates that youngster hmm. to do his job well because he knows that his client, even a little bit of recognition from his client, hmm. who he is meant to keep satisfied, hmm. comes back to him Hmm. something in it for him, right? Hmm. So it's not just about doing the job for the job's sake, it's also about recognition. Hmm. 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 Not the 5,000 rupees that matters. It's the recognition which is much more important. Yeah. Because yeah. everybody in the organization knows this guy has got five smileys this month. Right, 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 right. So they no. all wonder and look at him and say, how did you do it? Yeah, very different from our merits. I mean, somewhat similar to the merit you know, the gold stars that we used to get in school. But yeah, there was no money involved at that time. It was just uh, maybe a thump on the back from the yeah. nuns. Uh, so Rajiv, actually, you've spoken about all the experiments that worked for you during your career. Uh, yeah. Would you want to, do you have any experiment that did not work for you during your career? Barring the RWA, let's not go down the RWA route. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say the RW experience did not work for me. It actually worked pretty well. I had a very good team, very helpful team. We never fought with each other. Oh, great. That's <laughs> right. And so that's an experiment Point that worked. Experiment. I, I want to focus on something that didn't work for you. Well, well it, that's a bit of a tough one. Uh, but uh, I would say, you know... Um, Understanding some of the undercurrents and the politics of an organization hmm. is very important, hmm. right? Now, I had taken over a large uh, company as the president, hmm. and my job was to integrate it with a smaller company, which was a global multinational firm. Hmm. 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 And they had a smaller business in India. The, the larger business was merging with the smaller business. And I was in charge of that integration. Hmm. So that was all successfully done. Hmm. But I had decided that I will base myself in Delhi, not in Bombay, which was the actually the headquarters of the company. Okay. So I said, I as the president, I can decide where I want to base myself. Hmm. Hmm. So I said, I'll do Delhi instead of Bombay. I prefer to live in Delhi. Hmm. That was a mistake because hmm. there was an undercurrent hmm. of, let's say, some political developments which were taking place in the organization hmm. where the people who had been more or less acquired yeah. uh, as the smaller company hmm. were not happy with their situation and they were working with their global parent to try and oust the people from the larger Okay. Hmm, 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 hmm. And the lack of physical presence and judging the mood on a daily basis hmm. was not not possible because of the sheer distance. Because of the sheer distance, yeah. I think that was a mistake from my part because I didn't come out of that whole situation as well as I would have liked to. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So some of those guys hmm. took on the bigger jobs and I eventually decided to leave the company hmm. Hmm. because I had not managed that situation particularly well for myself. 
Yeah. So if I, you know, again, if I understand you, what you're saying is that the ability to have these informal networks and conversations within the organization is very important. You have to have the pulse of the you organization. Which is not always during formal meetings. It's that informal, you know, ripple of uh, energy that flows through the organization, which is important. Absolutely. Uh, and that is why these networks are important and informal uh, meetings or whatever are important. Now, since you're also a golfer, uh, what advice do you have for youngsters starting out on their career or in middle management? How can they, A, you know, everybody says, you know, golf really helps. Now, A, how does it help you advance your career? And B, if you don't have, if you don't play golf, what are some of the other sporting kind of events or sporting kind of activities that can help you uh, advance your career? Well, golf is certainly a great place because I believe sincerely in the power of networking to advance your career. Okay, talk more about this because everybody talks about networking, but the problem I find with networking is that the person I want to network with has somebody else he wants to network with and therefore he doesn't have time for me because he's constantly looking to network with someone else. So in my own case, the only job that I have interviewed for in 40 years hmm. was the first one. I see. And I have changed several companies, several countries, hmm. different businesses. Hmm. single one of those jobs has been they found me actually simply because of my network hmm. so hmm. Uh, it was who you know rather than what you know hmm. which actually got me those jobs hmm. 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 I mean I can't say that I, what you know was was absent but, but no, it, it has to be what you know as well, as well how, but I think, what, how you know so do you advice the youngsters to pick up a sporting habit get to people get to know people informally because networking events according to me are a waste of time because no, then I, everybody I, I is looking to network with somebody higher so i see i tell you uh, golf is a excellent place to network because hmm. you are on the golf course for four to five hours with two or three other people. Hmm. 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 Many of them are likely to be senior executives in their organizations. So sorry, but would the senior executive like to play with a junior executive? Uh, golf is fairly, fairly democratic game in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are not averse to playing with youngsters, especially if they're good players. Hmm. 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 Right? Hmm. And... Uh, and in fact, my club now has introduced a new app mm. which allows anyone to mm. walk into a group mm. if, if the group is not already booked. Meaning, mm. if two people are booked, the third person can just say, I'd like to join this group and he can join without asking permission from the others. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm. So that's like forcible networking. I mean, you get in there and you are talking to two guys who you don't know bef from before. Mm -hmm. You've got four hours, five hours to spend with them. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. Golf, apart from being a very difficult game, mm -hmm. huge test of character. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. How you play, how you angry you get when you don't play well. Do you cheat at all? Do you cheat, right, right, okay. right. Uh, mm. you respect your fellow players mm. Uh, mm. how do you manage setbacks because there are setbacks on every single game that you play mm. 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 it's a huge test of character so people are observing you on the golf course mm. Mm. and you form a pretty good idea by the end of 18 holes about the personality of, and character and traits of a particular individual right right You've also got enough time to exchange Mm. conversation mm. on topics about where he's working, what he's doing, what are his mm. goals. Mm. So, at the end of this, you have made not a friend, but at least a pretty good acquaintance. Acquaintance, right. Mm. Mm. Right? Now, it is not at all 
unusual for somebody mm. who has played a game of golf with somebody else. Mm. Call upon him and say, I'm looking for this type of role. Would your organization have? Mm. 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 Just the other day, one of the guys I have played golf with many years ago called mm. me and said, out of the blue, I'd like you to be my CEO coach. Ah, okay. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I had never interacted much with this gentleman. Hmm. He had played with me, had observed me, maybe we had some conversations. Hmm. He decided I am a decent guy to help him figure out his new role as a CEO in some hmm. 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 Now, what explains that? It's the networking that you've done on the golf. Hmm. I guess. Hmm. Hmm. So, uh, just like so, uh, the other place where uh, you can network, I mean, any sport, okay, hmm. any sport gives you that, hmm. that opportunity. Hmm. We have, I also am a tennis player, so I have a tennis group. Hmm. Uh, you know, 10, 15 people we play occasionally on weekends and so on. Hmm. Now, there have been many uh, business conversations which have arisen due to just our being. Oh, yeah. On the yeah. Tennis yeah. Yeah. So one of the guys who I play with is a is a, a team builder and a, you know trainer. So he has been recommended by me to companies to do training for them. Right. 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 Nothing. Nothing beyond the network explains that, right? No. So I think the message that I'm getting, which I guess a lot of the youngsters also should get is that your career progression is not only about the kind of and the amount of time that you spend in the office, on your desk, working. It is also what you do outside and, you know, start building a network, so to say, in your early life that's going to pay rich dividends in your later life. I mean, you can't get up when you're 45 years old and you know say okay now i need to start building a network people should know you people you know take time to figure out who you are so i think the youngsters should invest in doing some like in school we used to say no extracurricular activities right find something that drives them find something that motivates them interests them and spend time because that's one place where everybody is equal, like you said, democratic, uh, where it doesn't matter what your designation is. It's your common interest that brings you together. So that's Absolutely. something that people should uh, uh, keep in mind, especially if they want to continue on their upward journey as a leader. So, I also think you know, networking within your own organization is very important, also, not outside your organization. Yeah. You know, you take some effort, but you have to build relationships with people yeah. who are in different parts of your own organization because at yeah. some point or the other, you will need them and they will need you. They will need you. Yeah, and it's always a give and take. I mean, you can't always be a taker. You need to give, 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 and then maybe take a little. So, Absolutely. yeah, good. Very interesting conversation, Rajiv. And thank you again for your time. I think some very valuable insights especially for the young middle management, also for boards. Uh, and uh, wish you many, many, uh, many years of happy golfing and happy tennising. And uh, yeah, see you around. Thank you. Thank you, Toru. Thank you. Very enjoyable conversation.